let me say a word about the title, and that is Corporate Responsibility in, in Disease Elimination in the Developing World. Uh, how does it happen, and uh, who does it, and what is that responsibility? My, a bit about my background. <clears throat> I was trained initially as a chemist, as an undergraduate chemist, then went to medical school at Columbia University in the U.S., where I did medicine, internal medicine, and followed that with a residency at the Massachusetts General Hospital. So I'm a doctor, MD. Uh, after that, I went to the National Institutes of Health for 10 years. I went initially because I owed Uncle Sam two years of service time because I had been deferred although there was a doctor's draft at the time. And so I went there to, to take care of heart patients. I was a, became a heart doctor, and, and, uh, but while there I had the, the opportunity to learn any research field. And with my background in chemistry, I elected to work with Dr. Earl Statman, who was a giant in biochemistry at that time, and who was willing to take on an MD as a postdoctoral fellow, and uh, I remember meeting him for the first time, and after he told me about what he worked on, I said, see, that was interesting. Could I work in his laboratory? And he looked down at me and he said, uh, you know, Roy, I've never worked with an MD. And I said, well, Earl, I have never worked with a PhD. And so we agreed to take a chance and I worked with Earl for a couple of years, and then he invited me to stay on at the National Institutes of Health, which I did for an additional eight years. During that time, I studied and, and did research in, in fatty acid biosynthesis and lipid biosynthesis to the point where I became quite expert and, and uh, was then invited to become chairman of biochemistry at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri where I, in addition to doing research, uh, taught medical students, graduate students, and undergrads for about nine years. <clears throat> At that time, I really thought I understood biochemistry. And, and, uh, and, and by the way, you learn a lot when you teach different levels of students. Um, at that point, I was invited to, uh, to take the job to lead research basic research in drug discovery at Merck, in the Merck Research Laboratories. <clears throat> My initial reaction was that I had no interest in shifting into industry. I'm academic. And they said, why don't you visit and see what's going on? So I did. And what I learned was that Merck Research, which had been very famous in the past, had hit a plateau and, and was not was not satisfying management at that time that's coming up with the new, enough new products. And so they were looking for a new way to do that. And going around the laboratories, I found that, they, that there was wonderful chemistry available and wonderful biology, the two halves of the spectrum that you need for drug discovery. But the biology was based on studying animal models of disease. You take a mouse, a rat, a cat, a dog, and, and put into that animal a model of a disease, high blood pressure, an infection, inflammation, uh, whatever, diabetes. And then the chemist would be asked to produce, to make chemicals that would be fed or injected into the animals to see whether they had an effect on this model disease. And that was the way that people were discovering uh, new drugs in 1975. And I said, well, what, uh, in speaking to the groups, I said, well, what is the target of the chemical that you're making? And they said, well, we don't know. Well, this was a time of biochemistry just flowering, which was my field of expertise. So I thought in terms of molecules, chemicals hitting molecules, molecules interacting together where the chemist would understand what the target is and what it looks like in order to design a drug. And so they weren't doing that. And the more I thought about it, 
the more I became excited about the potential for drug discovery, something I hadn't thought about before. And so after a number of months, I decided to move to Merck. That was 1975. Well, how to get started in a, in, in a laboratory where everybody's doing something else and you'd like to introduce a new way to discover drugs, even though you had no background in drug discovery. Well, one thing I did was establish a program of my own, which was in the area of, of uh, regulation of cholesterol biosynthesis. Uh, the other thing is I went around to each laboratory, each group, and talked with the biologists and the chemists. And whether it was in endocrinology or cardiology or, or infectious disease, we talked about what molecules in the human or in the host or in the target organism, what molecules could be a target that when modified could lead to a drug. And, and so we, I spent a year doing that. And going around from place to place, I was able to convince people that that would be a new way to try drug discovery. And, and each of them, all but one, came up with a target. And so I was very satisfied. And the work in, in cholesterol biosynthesis started up very nicely. And ultimately, these programs, uh, one after another, started hitting their targets. So Merck came up with the first modern drug for glaucoma, two important antibiotics, primaxin, cefoxidin. Uh, they came up with the first statin ever introduced every, anywhere in the world, which was uh, Mevacor, and then, then Zocor, and then, so it was one drug after another. First drug for osteoporosis. And it was a, a whole series of firsts. <clears throat> All of them followed and copied by the rest of the industry in time, but they were firsts at Merck. There was only one group that, that when I talked with them, and it was the parasitology group. Uh, they were, their, they were, their job was to find drugs that killed parasites. <clears throat> so I met with that group and they were, they were very good. They were led by a guy by the name of William Campbell. And after I talked with them about the excitement of molecular targeting, as I called it, <clears throat> they said, look, Roy, we don't understand this biochemistry stuff, but we have this model for drug discovery of a, of a parasitic drug, a uh, drug that would kill parasites. <clears throat> I said, what is that model? They said, well, we have a mouse. And in the mouse, we plant into the abdomen some worms, some parasitic worms. And then we feed the, the mouse uh, either chemicals or, or, or a juice, some fermentation fluid from, from a microorganisms sent from around the world. And, and I said, that's going to work? They said, yes, it might. And, 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 and we don't understand biochemistry. I said, well, you do that. And so we agreed that this would be one group that would be unique, that would use a different approach than the one I was preaching. That was OK. You do want to go in the direction of, the, of what your people really know something about. And so that, that the, all the groups took off. And within a short time, the, the parasite group uh, came to see me and they said uh, they had an exciting result. What was that? Well, one of the fermentation products was able to kill parasites at a very, very low concentration, a very low dose. I said, well, tell me about it. And they said, well, they're, they're, we've been receiving drugs. We have contracts with people around the, around the world who send us microorganisms from, isolated from the, from, from the soil. And, and, uh, and we ferment each of these, and we take juice from that fermentation and feed it to the mouse. I, I, was, re I was remembering the, the, the program, of course. And, and, and we have this microorganism from, from the laboratory of Dr. Satoshi Omura in Japan, which does fabulous things. And we can dilute it way down, and we see a killing effect on all the parasites. So that was exciting, and, and they quickly followed up and, and isolated the substance in that fermentation, uh, which, was, which was avermectin, a brand new molecule, which was quickly identified by George Alper Schoenberg, one of our uh, analytical chemists at Merck. 
And the molecule was brand new. It looked like an antibiotic. It was, it was a, a rather large molecule, uh, but brand new. And, and, it was, and it had potency and a breadth of spectrum of killing parasites that was unbelievable. It never had been seen before. Very exciting. So we really put together a team then, led by William Campbell, uh, to, to follow up on this, on this product, potential product. It had a deficiency. First of all, it wasn't quite safe enough in toxicity studies. And so the chemists took avermectin and, and, and reduced one double bond stereospecifically, a single double bond, one, one chemical step, and that made it safer. So we now had a safe drug that killed parasites, but it did not kill at a, it wasn't potent enough for hookworms or tapeworms. And so it wasn't going to be interesting for, for use in humans. So the drug was developed initially to kill parasitic worms and, and had long studies done by the Merck scientists to show that it was safe and effective in killing worms in, first in horses, which were not eaten, at least in the U.S., and then cattle, sheep, pigs, and ultimately dog heartworm. Uh, and if you, have a, if you have a dog and feed it, feed it uh, a tablet once a, a month for heartworm, that is ivermectin. So the, excuse me, the drug was, was commercialized for uses in animals. In 1981, uh, Bill Campbell, Dr. William Campbell, uh, made an observation that this drug, ivermectin, uh, was able to kill a, a very unusual parasite in horses, which went through a microfilarial stage. And, and he got together with a Dr. Mohammed Aziz, who was, was from Bangladesh, but actually educated in the UK, and, 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 then, and then went to uh, uh, worked in the World Health Organization where he had seen a disease called river blindness in Africa. And so the two of them, Bill Campbell and Mohammed Aziz, uh, came to talk with me and to tell me about a disease called river blindness. Well, river blindness, uh, they said, was a, a terrible disease uh, among poor people, largely in Africa, but also around the globe, some in Latin America, some in Asia. Uh, it, was, it was caused by a, a, a parasitic worm, Oncocercofolvulus, and, and it was transmitted by the bite of a black fly. And the way this happens is that people who have this infection have the microfilaria in their skin. Uh, the disease is transmitted when a black fly, which breathes along rivers, therefore the term river blindness, uh, bites a person with this infection, picks up the microfilaria from the skin, and within the fly, the parasite undergoes development so that when that fly bites another person, it injects a form of the parasite which can become an adult. Unless the parasite goes through the fly, the microfilaria, it cannot be developed into an adult. And so once it's bitten and injected into another person, those, those previous microfilaria can become adult worms. The, the male's about five or six inches, the female's twice that size. They live together in a lump in the skin the size of half of a ping pong ball. So a person with this infection will have a couple of these lumps. But most important, these adults get together and make millions and millions of microfilaria, which crawl through the skin and get into the eyes and ultimately cause blindness. There are 18 million, there were at that time, 18 million people losing their sight and over 100 million people who were at risk for this infection. There was no good drug for this, to control this. There was an old drug called diethylcarbamazine, which caused such serious side effects that patients did not want to take it because they would become, they'd become ill, often requiring hospitalization from the treatment. And so they weren't using the drug and the, drug, and the disease was uncontrolled. And so Mohammed said, you know, perhaps we could try this drug. And I said, why not? The ivermectin, and we gave it another name, converted it from, from an animal drug, we convert, made tablets out of it, 
And so Mohammed Aziz went to Dakar in Senegal, the western tip of Africa, and there he, he uh, uh, treated a group of patients. And the way they did that was to take a pinch of skin over the hip and, and take that skin and, and count the worms, the microfilaria, uh, examining under a microscope. And there they counted 25, 35 microfilaria per milligram of skin. Uh, and they, they, they gave one tablet of, of uh, ivermectin, or the new, new name, mectazan, one tablet to every person in the, in the group. And then they came back at the end of a month and took another pinch of skin, and they found there were no microfilaria at all. And there had been no serious side effects at all. And so it was rather miraculous and exciting. And so they came back to Rahway, to the laboratory, where they showed me the data, and I became excited. They were excited. And, and we called friends and uh, uh, colleagues from the World Health Organization who are expert in parasitic diseases and, and knew about uh, onchocerciasis. They came to the laboratory, looked at the, the data, and Im immediately started shaking their heads negatively. I said, what's the problem? They said, first of all, uh, something wrong with these data, there are no side effects. And if you were killing all these microfilaria, the patients would, would have serious side effects because they knew that from the experience with diethylcarbamazine. So they didn't believe the data, number one. Secondly, they said, you're not killing the adults, only the microfilaria. And, and uh, so that ultimately would not be very interesting. Thirdly, uh, uh, we have these planes that are going to be dropping larvicide along the edges of, of rivers, and we're going to kill the flies, so you don't have to worry about river blindness. And so they left to the laboratory, and immediately as they left, we started a large program at Merck, knowing that this was a fabulous drug, potentially, if we could develop it. And we undertook a program, although we knew that the targets, the patients would be among the poorest in the world. And so we were off and running, this was about 1982, and, and we have some people in the audience, Adrian Hopkins, started using the drug, he tells me, in 1988. Well, right, right, he was right in there right from the start, but this drug, of course, the program took a number of years to carry out, it was done in Africa, carried around, uh, covered about 1,300 patients, uh, they all came in, were examined, and, and uh, about 1,300 of them. It was a, a blinded study. It was a study that had a placebo and, and then three different doses. And then they brought in, so they examined everyone, took a skin snit, and counted the, the number of worms, microfilaria. The average was 50 microfilaria per milligram of skin. So these people were teeming with these microfilaria. And they were scratching like crazy because that's what these things cause. And they get into the eyes and cause blindness, of course. So, so these were really heavily infested patients. So they gave, they gave a quarter of them a placebo and then three different doses to, to the three different quarters. And then they came back, they brought them back in three days and, and uh, took a skin snip again, and the number of microfilaria had dropped by 85% in three days. And then they came back at the end of a month, and there were none. Then they came back at three, six, nine, and 12 months, and there were no microfilaria, virtually none, till the 12th month, when there were a few. And it was clear at the end of that experiment that we had a drug that would be able to control onchocerciasis, river blindness, by using one tablet once per year. So we had a very exciting drug, and, and we were very excited. To, we talked to the marketing people, how were we going to get this distri distributed? They said, oh, we'll come up with a nice low price, and, and it will be affordable. And so we, we said, fine. The, they went away to come up with their nice new price, low price. They came back and they said that there's no price that they can afford. So we're stuck. We then turned to a few 
African uh, governments and, and approached them and said, would it be possible that they would buy the, purchase the drug from Merck at a very low cost, of course. They said, they said blindness is not that big a high, high a priority in the sub-Saharan Africa, in the communities where this was very, very severe. So we, we turned to the U.S. government, and we visited the, uh, the secretary, the, the uh, uh, deputy secretary of state, John Whitehead, and, and, and after that, the chief of staff of President Reagan, uh, whose name was Donald Reagan. In each case, I went in and, and d told them about the exciting potential of a drug that could prevent blindness in millions of patients. And John Whitehead said, Roy, we're going to plant the American flag all over Africa. I said, yeah, 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 yeah. And so as I walked out of his office, uh, his assistant came to me and said, Dr. Badger, that's a very interesting story, but uh, we don't have the money. I said, we're talking about a, f a couple of million dollars to start. They said, but it's not in the budget. And so we were left with no source uh, to cover the costs of the drug. We had filed all the information for approval for use in humans uh, with a number of sophisticated regulatory agencies, but the one we were targeting was France because, there's, because of French Africa. There are people even in, in Paris who had river blindness. And so they're anxious to get the drug. And although very usually extremely slow in processing uh, drug applications, uh, the French were very quick. They called, and we were completely unexpectedly, and said they were about to, to approve the drug. At that point, the executive, I had gone from head of research to head of the company. At that point, I had been meeting with the executive group on a weekly basis to come up with a way to distribute the drug, and we did not have one. And, and suddenly we were confronted with a Friday call from France that they were going to approve on a Monday. And so we needed to have a plan. <clears throat> we did not have a plan. By Monday morning, we had a plan. We went to Washington, we had a press conference, and we announced that Merck would, just, would contribute the drug free to anyone in the world for as long as it was required. Uh, that was uh, a meeting that was attended by the the head person of the World Health Organization, Ted Kennedy, was, who was the senator in charge of the Health Committee of the Senate, the two senators from the state of New Jersey. Everybody wanted to be with a winner. And so they were all there. It was a very exciting meeting. <clears throat> Merck, had, Merck made that announcement and took on the responsibility without really understanding the total responsibility and, and what that liability could lead to. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so we were off and running. So how to do this? How do you start distributing a drug that you're going to contribute free? Well, the first thing we turned to was Bill Fage. Bill Fage had been responsible, in part, for the eradication of smallpox. And, and he was, at that time, head of the Carter Center in, in Georgia. And so we approached Bill and asked him to head what we call the Mechtizan uh, Expert Committee, and, and he agreed to do this. Their job, and, he, and we supported a small group that, that he led uh, who would determine which communities, largely in Africa, were ready and able to accept a contribution and keep track of the patients who received the drug and keep track of all the side effects, which had to be reported to us. We had to understand the total impact on a large population. That program started in 1988, and, and Bill had led that program for many years very effectively. <clears throat> the program started at zero, of course, and started picking up millions of patients who were to be treated once per year. Initially, the patients were wary of taking a drug that, that was not being taken by Americans. Why would this company be giving them drugs that were not being used in their own country? Are they being used as guinea pigs? And so they were rather uh, uh, doubtful. But they took their first dose, 
And, and after the first dose, they stop itching for the first time in their lives. And they, then they passed some dead worms in their feces. And both of those events were very happy for them. They saw these dead worms, they stopped itching. Why not? And so everything was off and running from then on. And the next year, since they were yearly dosing, they came lined up instantly when the team arrived for the annual uh, drug dosing. So it started at that time, 1988, and over years grew up so that last, oh, I should, I should mention that about 19, the mid-1990s, the uh, observation that uh, ivermectin, mectazan, also was able to control uh, lymphatic filariasis uh, was made, and, and the Merck company agreed, and this after I had to retire at age nine, I was 65 at the end of 1994, and so I was out. You have to leave the company when you're a CEO at that age. And so my successors then agreed to add uh, lymphatic filariasis to the contribution program. And so the company has start, took on this responsibility. Last year, 2015, they treated free about 260 million patients, something over one quarter of a billion patients received free drug. And they wouldn't have received it without people like you, Adrian, and, and the people. Now, the organizations that really became responsible for the drug distribution, because Merck made the drug available free. They did not distribute it to all the villages, the cities, the places that needed it. The distribution was covered by place, uh, people like, like this, a couple who initially started a foundation, which they called the River Blindness Foundation, then the World Bank, the Gates Foundation, the WHO, of course, was, was involved. The uh, many NGOs got into it. And over the years, this has been a prime target to try to eliminate, initially to control, but later to eliminate river blindness. And in a number of countries, uh, Ecuador, Mexico, Colombia, uh, later, perhaps, Guatemala, soon some countries in Africa. But the target now is elimination globally. A fabulous target for a company to contribute its own drug to free uh, over a quarter of a billion people. Uh, anyway, that is a target that, that's been undertaken and it's going extremely well. Now, was that a responsibility of the company? Well, I would say any health company that is a strong research company along the way of discovery and success from other products that are distributed commercially will come up with potential products that can be, uh, can be uh, given away free. And there's where you have the will and where you have the capability and the, and the strength of research this is going to happen, and it's a fabulous uh, opportunity for the company because the response to such situations defines the character of a company. And I would say that was one of the defining moments of Merck character. And the ultimate uh, beneficiaries, of course, are the patients who receive the drug. But a side beneficiary, which is not to be overseen, are the people of the company. Because the, the feeling engendered within the company, the response of the workers, the employees at Merck, was unbelievable. This became a company that was second to none. And I will tell you, over many decades, Merck could recruit anybody they wanted because people wanted to work there. So there was an enormous feedback, unexpected, of course, which, which was a benefit uh, to the company. But let me tell you another. So this is, a, this is an example of a drug company discovering an important drug that went uniquely to people who were poor and could not afford it and was given away, was contributed free. A different story entirely and that is hepatitis B. 
an infection uh, caused by a virus that, that uh, at the beginning of the story was unidentified. Uh, Barry, oh, I, I, I didn't mention at the end, but you all know that Bill Campbell received the Nobel Prize, of course, last year. So Bill, uh, who in his true Bill Campbell-like way, when he received it, he said, I shouldn't be receiving this alone. It, it was the Merck team that did this. Uh, but, but the leader of that team and the, the, the person who deserved the Nobel Prize was Bill Campbell. And this is a very rare event that an, an industry uh, person, an industry scientist, should receive a Nobel Prize, then I say it's uh, rare and it's a shame because such important work comes out of industry, but there's enormous bias against it within that committee that selects. So, it's my opinion. So, <laughs> so let me go on with the, with the uh, second story, and that is, uh, started, uh, came to mind because uh, the person who began this story is Barry Blumberg, who was a graduate of Columbia University, who then came to Oxford. So he has an MD first, and then came to Oxford to get a PhD in biochemistry. And uh, he was interested in, in discovering uh, uh, infectious diseases and other diseases in global populations. He went around the world with little electro gel electrophoretic tubes. I don't know whether you remember them. They're old things. They were very common. They looked like a pencil where you put a drop of blood, uh, blood plasma at the top and, 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 and you put a current through it and the, and the, the proteins would go uh, from top to bottom and distribute themselves. So you could see a blood pattern of proteins from every patient. And he went around the world and uh, looking at these patterns, and, and, and when he was in Australia, among the Aborigines, he saw an, an unusual protein. It was a pattern, it was a protein that he hadn't seen on average in any, any other country. And, and so he came back to the U.S., and he, and he isolated this protein, and he put it in various tests, and he found that it reacted with an antibody in blood of patients who had recovered from what was then called serum hepatitis. It was a hepatitis that they came down with after they had had a blood transfusion. And, and nobody really knew what the cause of this serum hepatitis was at the time. Well, so uh, uh, Barry Bloomberg uh, started studying this protein and in the blood of these uh, patients, Aborigines, and he found some patients in the, in the Bowery uh, section of New York City. They were people who were either intravenous drug users or, H or, or, uh, or gay males. Same uh, high risk group as HIV now, known now. Uh, so he found this protein and, and he, was, he was studying this protein <clears throat> and, and patients of course with serum hepatitis. And he was studying the protein in the blood of such patients he then saw some particles also, and these were virus particles. So he isolated the particles and he isolated the protein. The particles, the virus, turned out to be hepatitis B virus, which he identified for the first time and characterized. And the particle, the protein, was a surface protein from the surface of the virus. So hepatitis B, which was discovered in 1966 by Barry Blumberg, was he, he identified the virus and this protein, and they were separate. And, and he took this protein and, and he stuck it into a mouse and elicited an antibody. And so he, he said, gee, this could be the basis of a vaccine. If there's a virus and the virus can cause an antibody and be protected. Perhaps this protein, which is on the surface, would also be seen as a part of a virus and have an antibody which could neutralize the virus. So he made that, he, he took a patent on that. Well, what is hepatitis like? Hepatitis B in the US, and I suspect in the UK, other developed countries, is a very low incidence disease, largely among uh, gay males and intravenous drug users. Most people who have an acute infection 
their, their immune system handles it and, and, and beats down the virus. But about 0.4% of the people in the United States uh, end up carrying the virus and the surface antigen in their blood. And, and they, keep the, they keep the virus hidden away in their liver, quiescent for some time, but then causing acute infections and, and then often chronic hepatitis and in some cases uh, primary liver cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma. And so this is a virus that causes chronic liver disease and cancer. Well, Barry Blumberg had projected that one could make a vaccine using this surface antigen. He called it the Australia antigen, based on the original uh, observations. And, and he, he then uh, said uh, this could be a vaccine. It came to the eyes of Morris Hilleman, the czar of vaccines at Merck. Morris was a genius. He was the father of mumps, measles, rubella vaccines that were used all over the world at that time. And, and he knew how to make vaccines. Uh, so he undertook to isolate this, this protein from the blood of the carriers, uh, the kinds of people I mentioned before. He, he collected gallons of blood. He exsanguinated all these people in New York took this blood, isolated the protein, and characterized it, made, uh, isolated, made it absolutely pure, and, and uh, made it convert it into a vaccine. He used the protein, the pure protein, he injected into a chimpanzee, which is the closest to a human, and he elicited an, an antibody. And then he followed that uh, experiment by, by injecting the chimps with a live hepatitis B virus and showed that those patients, those chimps who had made an antibody were protected against the challenge of a live virus. And, and that's exactly what happened. They were protected. And so we had a vaccine which then Mer uh, uh, Morris took into the clinic in large clinical studies, thousands of patients, the high-risk group that I mentioned, including medical personnel that have contact with, with body fluids. And he found greater than 90% protection by the vaccine. So this was 1981, the first vaccine that would protect against a virus infection that left untreated or un unneutralized could end up with liver cancer. So it was the first vaccine that protected against primary liver cancer. That was 1981. Well, what else happened in 1981? AIDS first popped up. Who was getting AIDS? Young men, gay males, intravenous drug users. Vaccine was being produced from the same group. Doctors immediately started thinking, gee, we're using it, we're, we're using it as a product to protect something that could be giving a disease, the cause of which we don't understand, because AIDS had no known cause for two years. So the use of the, of the vaccine uh, just dropped like a stone. It went down close to zero immediately, very quickly. In 1987, several years before that, <clears throat> we had the idea of using recombinant technology to make this same peptide, this antigen. <clears throat> we got together with Dr. Bill Rutter at the Univers uh, uh, University of California in, in San Francisco, UCSF. And, 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 and he was an expert in recombinant technology. Uh, Mars Hilleman's group had the virus, had the, all the assays, had the pure antigen, that was the product of what we wanted to make. And so I suggested to Bill that we cooperate, the two groups would cooperate, and, and make, the, uh, make the antigen in a microorganism so that we could get away from, the, from the, the virus. And he agreed to do this. So the initial tries to put the, to clone the gene for the surface antigen and put it into an E. coli, 
microorganism, Escherichia coli. He tried that, and the organism did not express the, the uh, protein very well. So we then, we turned to Ben Hall, Dr. Ben Hall at the University of Washington, who was a yeast geneticist. And, and he was able to put the clone gene from the virus into Baker's yeast. So we now had the Baker's yeast able to, to express the protein that otherwise is made by a virus. But there's no virus left. And so we now had a producing uh, organism, which is Baker's yeast, which you could cook up in the kitchen and, and, and make a vaccine. And so that became the basis of a vaccine uh, where we, we isolated the protein, showed that it was very similar to the one that you isolate from humans, uh, that it was uh, caused an antibody in a chimp and caused an ant and a protection of a chimp, and then it went into initial human studies and showed that it did the same thing at the, as the initial antigen uh, vaccine. And so, and so uh, uh, the, the drug, the vaccine was approved, the second one, 1984, um, it, yes, 1984, uh, the first recombinant vaccine in the world, again, uh, and, and uh, that became the product that was used initially for the high-risk group, medical people, uh, intravenous drug users, uh, gay males, but ultimately used in all school children in the United States. And, and, and in the developed world, it slowly made its way so that it's being used by essentially everybody, a very safe vaccine. So that was very important. Well, in the, about 1987, the Chinese, I told you the, the incidence of carriers in the U.S. is about 0.4%. Uh, about 1987, the Chinese started talking to us. The Chinese uh, reported to us that they had an incidence of carriers in China Nine to ten percent of their population is infected. Nine percent of a population of 1.2 billion. And, and um, they had already started, as the Chinese often do, they copied the uh, initial vaccine work with, made from, from blood, isolated from, uh, from blood. So they had an initial vaccine, but they no way they could make enough vaccine to, to uh, immunize their their population. Now, the transmission in China is entirely different. It is not, it's not lateral uh, by body fluids in, uh, among uh, adults. In this instance, the incidence is so high that 9% that of, the, of the women are, are carriers. And so when they, have a, when they have a baby, they transmit the infection right after birth. And, and, uh, uh, that th those mothers that have a baby, that, who mothers are carriers, 100% transmission to the baby, essentially. So all the babies have. And, and so by the time a Chinese is 35 years old, who picked it up at birth, they've had the infection for 35 years. And it was one of the most common causes of, of, of illness and death in China. And so this was a very, very serious problem. And, and here was a vaccine that they knew would be protective. Oh, and they showed, some experiments were done in Taiwan, that demonstrated that immunizing an infant directly after birth, within the first 48 hours, could essentially prevent that transmission. <clears throat> so they could protect their newborns. And, and so they knew what they had to do, but they couldn't do it. And so they asked to to get into the Merck vaccine. Well, the, the, the first vaccine, of course, was rather expensive. <clears throat> but it was, uh, I recall, about $100 per person uh, for a course of three injections to be fully immunized. <clears throat> they could not afford it, even at a very low price. And so ultimately, we ag agreed to a technology transfer. Now, by this I mean, we agreed to have Chinese scientists and engineers and technicians come to Merck for one year. They came to learn how to make the vaccine, but we asked them to pay for that transfer. 
The total cost to them was seven and a half million dollars, one-time payment. So Chinese scientists and engineers came from Beijing and from Shenzhen, two different cities. And they came, and two teams, actually they competed with each other. They did not want to, the other one to get ahead. And, and they, they came to Merck and they, said they lived in the U.S. for one year, uh, where they learned the process of, of uh, growing the yeast, isolating the antigen, and making a vaccine. They bought the, the equipment, brought it to Merck, and put the equipment together. Then their engineers and our engineers put it all together in boxes, and they sent, sent it to Beijing and Shenzhen. And, and, uh, and then they went together and they built two plants, one in Beijing and one in Shenzhen, with a capacity to immunize 20 million infants per year, which was the birth cohort. That program started in 1994 uh, and 95. The two plants were started at that time. Within 10 years, they were immunizing 90%. Uh, uh, last year, in fact, early this year, my wife and I uh, visited Beijing, and they uh, are immunizing virtually all newborns. Everybody is immunized. And of course, the, the, uh, uh, the carrier rate after these immunizations has dropped first down to about 0.5%. Now it's even lower. It's going to disappear, clearly. Uh, and, and the incidence, so the incidence of the younger group has dropped to the bottom. Unfortunately, the, you vaccinate older people who already have the infection, 9%, they are not affected. They have to be treated as they become acutely ill, if when they do, with antivirals, which are now available but very expensive. Uh, and so there will be a time when that population passes on, of course. But the, the, infection by hepatitis B in China will be eradicated on the basis of a vaccine that was introduced uh, at essentially no cost. Merck walked away in 1995, leaving the plants, no royalties, nothing, other than the feeling good about having prevented hepatitis B in Chinese infants. And, and so, uh, this is two, two different stories, one about a drug that was, that was taken on with full knowledge that the people who needed it were very poor and they would never get it without a contribution. That was ivermectin, mectazan. And secondly, a, 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 a vaccine, which I, I should say this, I, ivermectin is not used in people anywhere else in the world uh, it's, not used, it's not a commercial product at all. The hepatitis B vaccine is an important commercial product, but in instances of a place that really needed it at a time uh, where it was disastrous, they did not get it, Merck provided the technology free uh, and was able to cut off that uh, an epidemic type of uh, disease that was going on in China at that time. And so, what is the, the disease elimination corporate responsibility? What is the responsibility of a company? First of all, you need to be successful in, in your commercial work because otherwise you can't give things away. Secondly, you have to have the will to, to carry through and follow up with people who really need your product and make sure they get it. I think that is the responsibility of a really great company. And, and, and thirdly, the benefit distribution, as I said, of course, the people who receive the drug or vaccine benefit enormously, but the company itself, the people of the company benefit enormously also. So that's the story and I thank you all for being here. Thank you very much for that uh, illuminating talk. Um, it is 11 o'clock, but um, I think after that, if people have got some questions, and I can see one from the audience already, so 
Uh, yeah, there'll be a couple. Roy, do you want to come back up on the stage? Um, can we get a microphone to Alan? Or Alan, would you like to come up? There's microphones up here. Roy, thank you very much. I'm a tropical parasitologist, and I've been teaching parasitology for 40 years. And uh, <laughs> I didn't tell the story, and don't tell the story quite as well as you did. It's an incredible honor to have you here. And I think on behalf of everybody, I'd like to say thank you for coming. <laughs> the foresight with which you donated that group <laughs> on behalf of the years before, before your time almost. And I first learned about Bill Campbell getting, I thought you weren't going to mention it, uh, Bill Campbell getting the Nobel Prize. Um, ten minutes after it was awarded because the BBC phoned me up and said, come and tell British people what the hell is obvious accountancies and what is river blindness. And uh, I remember saying to the interview that I, I was a little bit sad that you didn't get it 15 or 20 years earlier. Should have. But I think better later than never. And my final point is that um, Merck led the way. And today, uh, those of us, and there are many in the audience who are working to control and possibly even eliminate the effect of tropical diseases, are all terribly dependent on the donations of the various drugs from at least six, if not more, pharmaceutical companies. And, uh, your, your story was, was the leader, and I'd like to thank you again. Thank you very much. Well, we're, we're, we're leaders because we, we had people like Bill Campbell, and we had, uh, as I mentioned, a number of product candidates at the time, all of which were first in the field and have made an enormous impact on health. And to have Bill Campbell get the Nobel Prize was a wonderful thing for all scientists and the entire people working at Merck. So it was a great recognition for things. So thanks very much. And Jim, yes. Uh, Jimmy Woodford from the Tropical Medicine. I've been lecturing about Merck for about 25 years and I always tell the story about this unprecedented donation that the government made but I'm afraid my students are a rather sceptical bunch, and they really want to understand what were the drivers for, for Merck to make what was an unprecedented philanthropic gesture at that time. It's not the sort of thing that large pharmaceutical companies normally do. So could you say a bit more about what were the the, the real motivating factors <laughs> for doing that, how did you persuade the money men that this was a sensible thing to do, rather than simply concentrating on the lucrative veterinary market for um, Yeah, yeah. Well, interesting question, you know, why did we do it? I started by telling you that my background was not in business. I, I was trained as a physician, and my ultimate interest was taking care of people and, and human health. Uh, and I was that throughout my career. So that when it came time to uh, market products, I, of course, was anxious that we'd be successful and get the products to the patients. But when it came down to patients who could not afford the drugs. I was always looking for ways to get around that. And this was an opportunity uh, that came so rapidly and so suddenly, it sort of fell on us. There were no alternative ways to get the product ivermectin, mectazan, to, to patients at that time other than contribution. And I did not hesitate a moment. In fact, it came so fast that I did not consult with members of the board, uh, the, the board of directors. And so uh, it, didn't, it didn't even cross my mind. I'm not a corporate type. I spent half my career in academia. I'm no different than most of you. At the, at the next board meeting, and I was chairman of the board at the time, one of the directors actually 
the person who preceded me as CEO at Merck, John Horan, turned and said, Roy, why is it you didn't call any of the directors to, to get our agreement? I said, well, I'll tell you the truth. It happened so quickly it didn't cross my mind that I needed to talk with anybody. Uh, but would any of you have made a different decision? And I looked around the table and everyone shook their head, no. And so I was excused. It wasn't the only thing I forgot to talk to the board about. Good morning, my name is Steve Holmes. Um, as a representative of the this morning, I just want to uh, thank you and work on behalf of many of the millions of people uh, around the world, in Africa, the Middle East, and Latin America, where I lived, uh, who benefited from the donation of Texas and over the years. I had the pleasure of holding the uh, WHO missions uh, to verify the elimination Transmission Office of Crisis in Colombia, Ecuador, and Mexico. And it was amazing work for 15 years working in those regions to know that I could walk in villages where there were still individuals uh, with office of crisis, including the children. And over a course of 15 years, of course, where we were, to see no new children, no new no children, again, in fact, it was orange, uh, no adults, uh, and knowing that none of them would be blind from their blindness. So uh, I just reflected on that, the uh, hard work of WEPA, the Mexican Foundation Committee, and the Ministry of Health in those countries. It's an extraordinary uh, event that uh, has occurred to see uh, the elimination of this particular disease uh, in the Americas and now also beginning to unfold in other parts of the world. So thank you on behalf of uh, those individuals well, thank you for the, uh, for the work that all of you have done, who have worked in, in uh, uh, Uncle Sir Caius and helped get this done, because without your work, uh, Latin America wouldn't be becoming free of, of uh, river blindness, and the same of the people in Africa, of course. So it has been a team effort. We have, we have now involved uh, a number of groups, including the community groups, that have gotten together to bring together the patients, the NGOs, and the drug. So it's been a team effort. Without, without the team, it never would have gotten done. And it's not finished. I think the, the objective for everyone now has to be disease elimination. And you understand that only humans carry this uh, this uh, parasite, onchocerciasis, and therefore, and animals don't. And so if you treat large populations, give everybody a tablet of ivermectin, the, my, the black flies don't have a source for the microfilaria, and so the disease will disappear, will be eradicated ultimately. That should be the objective, and I think that is the objective of Merck. Although I, I've been long gone, Thank you.